today on Straight Talk Africa, a conversation on the need to change the education curriculum in Africa to prepare students to be more productive in the real world. That discussion is coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali, and today we are exploring ways of learning that are student-centered and how those can be used to rethink Africa's education systems. Education has the power to transform people worldwide, but some argue the effectiveness of current African educational systems are outdated and governments need to rethink how to make programs more competitive. My colleague Paul Ondiho explains. A UNICEF report titled Education Under Threat in West and Central Africa warns that a deliberating targeting of schools, students and teachers is sweeping across the region. More than 1.9 million children have been forced out of schools due to an upsurge in attacks and threats of violence against education facilities. Education remains a fundamental tool to alleviate poverty in most African communities. Educational systems worldwide are undergoing massive transformation and development. For example, in Ghana, TechAid has developed a different solution to deliver educational content to rural schools using new technology. TechAid has developed e-solutions to tackle some of the country's challenges by building a network of over 70 educational labs in rural areas. Kafui Prebi is one of the founders of TechAid. We've been in this space for close to 10 years, um, delivering technology solutions in education and supporting rural development. And two of our key products that we've developed over the period is EduLab, which is our education computing solution for schools, mm. and with the latest one, which is Asanka, which is a content delivery system. Kenya's Discovery Center, a social enterprise, is also trying to change how kids learn in schools. They have developed a creative ways to make science, math, and technology exciting and interactive. Daniel Gichuki Muhoro is the chief executive officer. Children's innovation and inquisitive nature needs to be nurtured so that when they get to preteen, they are still inquisitive. A World Bank study says education in Africa is underdeveloped and has been a low priority for decades despite a tremendous increase in student enrollment at all levels. Dr. Rollins Muganga, author of You Can't Make Fish Climb Trees, is proposing to overhaul the current educational systems across the board and perhaps adopt the authentic learning educational model. In Cameroon, Sophie Ngasa has created a curriculum based on sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics. She says targeting students as young as eight years old with digital skills prepares them for relevant career opportunities in the future. The technical schools that we have in Africa, particularly in Cameroon, is that the laboratories are not equipped. You have students doing a lot of theory and little practicals, and this limits them a lot. So they go to school and finally graduate and they can't really practice and they're not able to be competitive in the job market. Students learn how to develop websites, programs, apps, games and how to code. I'm really interested in the computer world. My dream is to, come a, to become a web developer and I think STEM is going to get me to where I want to go to. Ghanaian teacher Saski Pase, who wants to make schools more appealing to students, has created an unconventional method. The confidence level of expression was very low, and I found out that to, uh, the interaction between uh, the kids and the teacher, which is a teacher-people's relationship, was very low. So I decided to come out with a dance, which will build up uh, this great companionship between with the teachers and the kids, and also to build up their self-confidence in class as well, and to make school attractive to this kids. So that they won't miss school. Perhaps uh, Africa needs uh, more people like Pasi, who are thinking outside of the box, uh, changing their communities, 
and inspiring a whole new generation of young students. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. And joining us today is our distinguished guest, Dr. Lawrence Muganga, author of the book, You Can't Make a Fish Climb Trees, Overcoming Educational Malpractice Through Authentic Learning. He is also a policy and strategy advisor and often consults with schools and international aid organizations on how to deliver meaningful learning. Well, I have to say uh, from the deepest, better part of the bottom of my Kabale heart and soul that I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Indeed, for the first time. It is a huge pleasure to be here too uh, in your studios. It's very interesting because uh, we've talked before and you've said a lot of things and uh, yes. I recall that uh, you autographed a copy of your book, You Can't Make Fish Climb Trees. Yes. You autographed it for me and you said, Ndugu Dr. Shaka Sari, even though I have no clinic, thank you for <laughs> being a huge inspiration of mine in this journey we call life. That's very true. Life, life is a journey, and uh, mine was a tough one, right, growing up. So at some point, I stumbled on a radio back in Africa, in Uganda, and that was uh, uh, Voice of America. So, and one station we used to really listen to was uh, uh, Voice of America, like. And then there was this person I had no clue about. Uh, and his name was uh, Shaka Sali. So hearing the name Sali resembled the name I often hear in, with my classmates, my uh, neighbors. But then there was also the other part of the name Shaka. I said, OK, I have also studied some history, and there are some Shakas in South Africa. But uh, regardless, this person must be African. And, but I took the nearest part, Sali. So I said, oh, how did he make it? This person, if this person comes from Uganda, how did he make it? And that was, uh, remained an inspiration for me. If this guy from Uganda, or even from South Africa, has made it to Voice of America, if I work hard, I can't be somewhere. And I never missed any episode of uh, Africa World Tonight. There are times I used to hear you show up on Daybreak Africa, and then uh, growing up as now a man, a father, straight talk Africa. So you think that uh, I may in fact have made some contribution, however modest, uh, for your eventual uh, destination to Canada? No, do no doubt about it, uh, because not me alone. There are so many people like in my circles that we used to discuss. Uh, are you missing Shaka's uh, show tonight? No, let's go. And we converge on one small tiny radio. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have one myself. My friend of mine had one. We converge there and listen to that. So the, the goal was to one day also uh, become experts in something and be somewhere. And at the end of the day, I found myself in Canada. So there's no doubt about that. It is very interesting because uh, in the mid-60s, when I was uh, uh, in uh, high school at uh, what used to be called Kegezi College Butovere, and uh, affectionately, affectionately known as Sinia, <laughs> <Senior. laughs> I had uh, a mathematics teacher. Right. And uh, I was particularly less than a mediocre in mathematics. And I remember him saying, because I was a star track athlete, I used to do 400 meters hurdles. I used to do triple jump. Yes. I used to be a striker on the football team. And one day in the mathematics class, he said, uh, Sally, apart from running faster around the track than your colleagues, and probably uh, scoring a lot of goals, I don't really think that uh, you'll end up uh, as something, really. 
anything. I don't think you'll make anything good out of yourself. So do you think that I may have actually have been, uh, may, is it possible that I may have disappointed that particular mathematics teacher? A hundred percent you have disappointed the, uh, this particular teacher. And that is, uh, at the heart of that is what the, what is everything wrong about the education systems we are talking about. Uh, now, could it be even uh, easier if they taught you mathematics using, using the strength mm. of these other things that you knew? I'll give you an example. I have seen a mathematics teacher in uh, Sweden uh, who takes kids, uh, grade three kids, in a basket, on, on a basketball court. Interesting. And then they, they learn how to add and subtract by shooting. And then the, the opposite team shoots, and then they minus, right? <laughs> so they may have, that's, the, that's wrong with, the, I mean, everything wrong with the education systems we, we are talking about right now. So by where you are right now, I don't even know if the, that teacher would love to remember those comments because it is, would be embarrassing to them. You know, he, I play that he comes across a line that says, the best revenge is massive success. <laughs> That's very true. Very yeah. interesting. And, and that is the same thing that happened to me most of the time. I, I remember like uh, going through some socioeconomic uh, issues uh, at home, like uh, especially economically, like w w my family was impoverished, right? And the only means to even get uh, fees to pay for my school was to either sell chickens and eventually my mom gave me some money to uh, start like some, uh, have some rabbit, a, a rabbit industry. Yes, some kind of small, small kind of uh, farm, like of rabbits, right? But when I started selling them, uh, and she found out when I told her, you know what, there are some students struggling to pay their fees. Mm. I am willing to, den to donate a few rabbits to these students and they can raise them, they can sell them off, they can raise fees and they can stay in school. She picked that up, called my parents and told them to shut down the initiative I was having at home because it is going to distract my education. You are wasting your time. Yes. But you know? your good mother, you know, was as an incredible lady because uh, she, according to what I read in the book, uh, she would wake up very early. 3 a.m. And uh, walk with you yes. to school. For almost 45 minutes. And we are minutes. talking about uh, 10 kilometers or 10 miles? Yeah, we are talking about uh, 10 kilometers uh, from where we are living to this only school in the community. So she could walk me almost ha like halfway to meet other students coming from different parts of the community. It was kind of a trading center, so we could move as a group. So then she has to go back on her own. So, and I did that for two years. She walked with me for two years. Mm. In other words, all those years, it, it is as though she was going to school too. She was a graduate <laughs> right? of, at least according to you in the book, of the second grade. Yes what they call primary two. That's right. And yet she had an incredible advice for you. She said that uh, you should strive to be the best that you could be, but also be of service to others. That's very true. To me, uh, I always tell people, uh, use this statement that uh, uh, she, she was uneducated, but educated. And by that I mean, if you go by the standards of the Western education, mm. she was not educated. That is the aspect that she didn't have. Exactly. And if you go by what really education means, she was educated. She probably, in fact, was not only educated, but a genius. That's very true. Let she me was ask you uh, incredible. a very simple question that yes. probably a lot of people are waiting to hear me ask. First of all, why did you, in fact, write this book? Uh, it is, uh, I had three reasons. Uh, one, if you have an education system that still pre uh, prevents students to look up things in this day and age where we have technology, but asks them to cram them, then there is a huge problem. And someone needs to talk about that. 
because there is no need, there is zero value in cramming something, memorizing something, and you move around with it and then reproduce it in a test score. But wasn't that uh, the traditional way of teaching, of learning? Exactly, that is it. But if the system is still holding that mm -hmm. as a virtue and a value that uh, it, uh, co contemporary students should embrace, mm -hmm. then that should be, someone should talk about it too. If this very same education system is telling uh, students, uh, for example, in Africa, right, that uh, uh, the, the guy who discovered uh, uh, here uh, River Niger is Mungo Park, like even though uh, he, he picked up some people to take him to that river. The doctor who eventually died of malaria. <laughs> that's very true. Mm -hmm. Then there is something wrong with that. And um, three, um, I think, which is very, very important. If this system is still asking students to collect dots, how many dots can you collect in this system? Rather than connecting the dots, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then it is a terrible system. Someone needs to talk about it. So, But what about uh, if, for example, you actually taught collecting and connecting the dots? It is great. But unfortunately, the system emphasizes collecting. How many, how many dots can you collect? And I will evaluate you according to the many facts you have gathered, right? But how many problems can you solve? That is not a question they ask. That, in fact, uh, at the time I was going to school, uh, was a negative because they looked at you as being a rebel, someone that was not traditional. Uh, you're trying to be imaginative. You're trying to be creative. You're trying really to be creative. That is the, that is the system, how it has been, uh, it was built and it, it remains like that. Like you, I mean, did, do you think, have, have you ever thought about like uh, you've, gone, you've gone through this system, like everyone who has gone uh, through school, have you ever imagined why uh, a teacher walks in and students have been told like the first time a teacher walks in simply say good morning mister so and so right yes it was a norm it is a norm right that means that uh, you have to have obedience you have yes. to have compliance yes. you have to be to follow the rules as they are it was pretty much like uh, a servant master that's right. Relationship. That's very true. Or slave-master relationship, really. But isn't that also a reflection, for example, of those times? We are talking about colonialism. Yes. Colonialism was not democratic. And for the most part, across the African continent, you still have countries which are essentially democratically challenged. That's very true. Uh, but here is the thing, uh, Ndugushaka. Uh, where we have the education system right now as is and how it came to be mm. is not the problem of African governments, how it came to be as is. But how it can be changed right. to make it something that actually is realistic to the days we live today is the problem of African leaders. Right? But, of course, they are preoccupied with different other things, abandoning the most important thing, education, which creates a vibrant uh, human race that they always need for survival, too, as, uh, as governments, right? You know, you raise a very important issue in your book. Mm -hmm. The issue of what you characterize as uh, one size fits all. all. Yes. That is what I went through, that is what you went through, and that is what others, other students right now as we talk, continue to go through. Uh, Any particular reason why African leaders cannot get it? I, I mean, uh, like you said, uh, some of them are, are busy uh, the number one policy that makes uh, sense to them is how much can they survive in power? How can they stay in power, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is a priority, right? So, but they pay less attention to the education of 
students. I, I'll give you an example of um, the entire, I mean, 23% of the world's population, ab about 23% is a student community, about 23%. But they're still going through what we are going through, what you and I went through, mm. right? Mm. And uh, the, the, the system that tells them that, you know what, follow rules. Be like your peer. Uh, I will process you this year, but if you're defective, I'll hold you until you become well processed to go to another level, right? And uh, once you, you're done and I've processed you so well, mm. and when I say processing, you understand how, how, how the, the language like that is similar to the industrial age kind of uh, situation, right? So once I process you well, I'll take you to the, uh, the, something we call the world, and you'll fit in, you'll get a better job. But that's not true. The real world it doesn't look like that. You're supposed to be a robot and you're sub sub supposed to be subjected to exams. That's very true. Um, is there any evidence to suggest, for example, that uh, passing an exam is a measure of intelligence or is it in fact a measure of effort? Uh, I mean, like, uh, I will tell you that uh, You've been a student, I've been a student, uh, research, too much research is out there. Uh, what it is not is that passing an exam will never transition into success in life, right? For sure. That doesn't and so there is no need really for, for example, talking about final exams because in fact there is no such a final exam that actually goes with you in real life because a final exam should at least reflect the fact that you have earned the skills for survival. The truth is, the truth is, the education system does not mirror the real life we live in. Because in the real life, who is going to ask you to write an exam? Right? Uh, who is going to... The only thing they are going to ask you is, there is a report you have to write. And if you get a few facts not realigning to what was talked about or mm. the work had, that has been done, mm. you'll consult someone who will give feedback. It will leave one person to go to another person, and you'll get the finished product you want, right? Uh, but an exam is uh, something that uh, eventually, I mean, in the 1900s, uh, as, as, as in 150 years ago, when this system really uh, was uh, predominantly needed, industrial mm. age, mm. Uh, it, it was something to try to process these students, get those ones who have followed the rules to the book, right? And then be able to work the 12-hour shift where they needed these workers, right? But these are not the days we live. This, we live in, cre in creative economy days. Now, Dr. Muganga, you yes. can't make fish climb trees. How did you come about this or such a title? Uh, you know... What inspired it? Let, let's even start with you. You talked about uh, you, were you were very, very good at running, yes. scoring so many goals. Yes. Right? I was very good in what was called uh, civics and later, of course, current affairs. Very true, current history. affairs, history. Geography, because uh, I wanted to go different places and all that kind of stuff, yes. Every young person, they had their natural abilities, right? But what the education system does, they sit you in a classroom, with all your natural abilities, passion, dreams, and everything, you come with them in this classroom. And another student comes with them. But you are taught something different. And they are going to assure you, including your parents, mm. that stick in school, listen to your teachers and your professors, everything will be all right. Right? In other words, they are educating you out of your natural abilities. In other words, they are teaching a fish to climb a tree. Meaning, if you had actually concentrated on who I am, what I'm passionate about, 
my natural abilities. It could be easier for me to be something I want to be in the quickest means possible. But you're asking me to become an economist, but I want to really become a chef, right? Cook all the best meals there is in life. So you're teaching that fish to climb a tree. So that kind of behavior, which I call an education malpractice, motivated me to come up with such a title. Really? Yes. You know, there is a saying that uh, all of life is about passion. That's very true. Action and reaction. And that uh, to ignore the passion, action, and reaction of your time or your generation is to risk having really not lived at all, <laughs> occupying space. Do you agree with I that? I agree, a hundred percent. And uh, that's the very, if, you, if you've read this book, it is uh, a call. Uh, long term, I want, uh, I want really to point out the inadequacies of uh, the education, the school system, uh, that, is trans that is failing to transition students into uh, their passions, becoming uh, really settled in their passions, mm. it, or even uh, going into the workplaces where they belong. But in the context right? of one size fits all, do they really care about people's passions? You know, at, at, previously they, they didn't care. But I think where we are right now, uh, we are at a time where they have to care. They have to care because I foresee the death of college, the death of universities as we know them, right? Uh, one, there are certain fundamentals we shouldn't really forget. One, uh, you realize that in so many countries, the population growth rate is reducing. Right? So if you have these ivory towers, these universities that used to have 20,000 students, at some point they will not have students. Right. So it will mean that actually education has to be realistic. I have to be, I have to work and gather the experience in the field, right, than sitting in a classroom. So you will shut it down. And we have seen so far, even here in America, I was watching news recently, mm. so far uh, 23 colleges are shutting, uh, shutting down. Like, shutting down. Yes, and it's a trend uh, that is happening in India, I've seen in the UK, like uh, things are happening, right? So people have to start thinking creatively, how better can we educate students to become actually uh, leaders and problem solvers rather than robots? Because there is a robot anyways. Uh, artificial intelligence and everything. Robots have been made. Mm, they they mm, can do that, mm, that job, right? Mm. So, but what can a, a human being bring on the table? Because it is, going to come to, uh, it is coming to a time, if it's not already here, uh, for uh, you to be able to, not to present what you know, mm. but to be able to present what, can, what you can do with what you know. Right. You know, it is very interesting because uh, when you look at uh, some of these standardized tests, for example, right. that allow you to go to graduate school and professional schools and A stuff GMAT. like that, yes, uh, GRE and what have you, right. Aerosat, you name it, uh, they measure uh, what they call IQ, intelligent conscience. What, what about the other conscience? Uh, we're talking about uh, curiosity, conscient, passion, conscient, environmental, conscient. conscient. What yeah. about those? Uh, that's, of course, mm -hmm. those are the gaps within our education system. Uh, similarly to what uh, you see, like the test scores they use like today, right? Uh, when you look at uh, Frederick J. Carey, when he came up with this in, in, in the 19th century, when they had pressure of so massive students that needed to be scored, right? Mm -hmm. He came up with this thing uh, to make the work of uh, teachers easier, right? And 10 years later, he really abandoned it and said, you know what? This thing was for this problem. It's no, we no longer have this problem, so we should go run away from standardized testing but they rebuked him because it was working for them and uh, they ignored him 
and it is still standing today. So that, that's the same thing. When we talk about uh, an IQ, uh, at least I, I want to believe someone like uh, the, the guy who came up with uh, multiple intelligences, right? Mm. He tries, but still he doesn't hit the mark. We, I will tell you that we cannot even account for how many intelligences are out there. Right? Mm. So, and the education system should be able to, uh, to take care of that, like teach students to learn, mm. acquire mm. as many intelligences as possible, right? Or very, develop them. Very interesting. Uh, Muganga, for a guy that used to walk 20 miles each day <laughs> in order to have access to that education right. in Uganda, somewhere in Uganda. How did it feel like uh, flying from Canada to Washington? Uh, you know, like I, I, I was talking to uh, some of the staff uh, before we came on air that uh, everything I find in Washington is big. Really? Compared to what you see in, in Canada, right? Uh, yet uh, Canada is bigger than the United States in terms in of, terms uh, of land, land surface, mass. Yes, yes, land surface, right? <laughs> Despite the fact that we have only 30, about 36 million people. And, well, Africa uh, is much larger. It's you know, probably, the U.S. probably can fit in Africa four yes. times. So asking me how I felt is, uh, I, I begin to mirror that child who is, uh, who is in Africa mm. right now. Mm. And... Uh, is uh, beaming with the hope that I'll make it someday. The only thing I can say is that, yes, you can make it if you do the right things, mm. if you put in the time, mm. if you put in the work, you will do this. But I also call upon the leaders to help that child, to make sure that first the system is really at least supporting this child to realize their dream. It, it is an interesting... Uh, they have to care. They have to care about this right, child. Right. They have to care about this student because... It, uh, that is the future of Africa. Yeah, it, it is, there is one thing I always uh, tell people that uh, uh, if... if uh, they, they always say that uh, uh, great, uh, receiving a great education means that you're going to succeed uh, and be happy in life. Mm. If it is not true, we should stop telling ourselves that that is very true, right? And mm. we should do something about it. So even these leaders should actually look in the mirror and really tell themselves that these systems are not working. We should, we should and have to do something about them mm. and change things. Well, there's a saying that uh, to whom much is given, more is expected. Yes. Time is not our best ally. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment. So please don't go away because we'll be right back with you. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them, today, not tomorrow. So let's connect, let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 17.30 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. We appreciate all of our audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. Be sure to watch our show there and leave a comment. Now let's look at what's on top. 
for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, Uganda is heading towards elections in 2021 and the biggest threat to President Yoweri Museveni may be a 37-year-old musician. The future of Uganda on the next Straight Talk Africa. And today we are discussing educational practices that better prepare students to be more productive in the real world. Our guest today is Dr. Lawrence Muganga, author of the book, You Can't Make a Fish Climb Trees. And on that note, of course, I would like to say again that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Thank you, Ndubishaka. It is a pleasure. It means, it means a lot to me. Yeah, You're most welcome, you. and uh, to be very honest with you, I can't wait to get the opportunity to take you for Nyama Choma <laughs> to exchange some social amenities. Taking me back to the roots. Right? You're most welcome. <laughs> Thank you. You're most welcome. <laughs> so uh, when you think about it, uh, what do you think needs to be done by our mother continent in order to make sure that they train and uh, socialize young people to take their rightful positions in harnessing the resources for the benefit of their people? That's right. Yeah, no, uh, yeah thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, I, I, wanted to, I want to draw you to something very important and you may be familiar with. Uh, and I've chosen to call it the African Indigenous Education, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if, if you remember... You very, mean uh, something that uh, taps or reflects traditional African yes, culture? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at uh, how learning used to happen, I'm, and I'm, I'm back to the days before uh, colonization and uh, the Western education had to set in. Uh, during that time, how, how, do, how did people learn? So the, the, the most import, important part thing there was that everyone was trained for a particular role yeah. to play in a community. True. Right? True. So the, the training happened with a purpose. And they knew what they were going to do. And they had someone, they had someone like the equivalent of a coach today, the yes. equivalent of a mentor, a facilitator, a guide. For Philosophers. Them. Yes. Yeah. That is education. Right? So now come back to the education as we know it right now, where you're going to sit a student in a classroom mm -hmm. for as long as how many hours, say, uh, give and take uh, six, let's say six. And they're going to do that for the entire year, right? And then they will do it for the entire, how many years of their lifetime uh, as, as students. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you tell them that, okay, go out and find a job. You, you, you have this kid going up to university. Yeah. In fact, there was, a, there was this recent case in Kenya, in the Kenyan capital Nairobi, where a former student of the University of Nairobi, and guess what, with a first class degree, degree. to boot, uh, and I think it was in actuarial science, mm -hmm. so, which That's right, normally yeah. is applicable in insurance companies, banks, and you name it, and what have you. Guess what? He could never find a job. He was, in fact, living, I think, in one of these slum uh, neighborhoods called Kivera, mm -hmm. which you probably know about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you believe it? So it, what it, are you supposed to tell a guy like that and his colleagues as society? You have told this guy and his colleagues that they, if they only they can be disciplined, they can work very hard at their work, that they will be very good people and useful members of the community. And yet, this guy has nothing to show for anything. Mm -hmm. Is it because these people uh, talk about and encourage people to work hard but perhaps not 
to work smart? It, 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 is, um, it is a combination of both. But it, here is uh, what I can uh, tell you and uh, tell anyone who is uh, uh, following us. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, we are facing the problems we are facing right now. Mm. And nobody, nobody like, uh, is willing to take the initiative initiative mm. to flip this thing we call the education system mm. because uh, right now uh, give and take I can say uh, Africa is averaging around 53% uh, percent of uh, youth unemployment uh, graduate unemployment mm. right mm. Uh, but we are talking about graduates right we, we have not touched the people who did not even make it for mm. some reason to Correct. to college mm. right mm. so so one would would conclu conclusively say that this is the largest scam we have ever seen in the history of the African continent where you tell people that go to school after school you'll be great and then this this very person is homeless. You do right? not provide the necessary infrastructure. No. The necessary logistics. Yeah, not in place at all. So why, then, why is that so? Is it because uh, Africa, as some have said, that uh, has a remarkable leadership deficit? Very much. It that the people, in fact, we call leaders, in fact, are not leaders. They are, at least according to some of these sources, it, rulers, uh, really. It speaks to that 100%. And uh, where are their pro uh, priorities vested, invested, right? Uh, but there is something that, is, that they can do. Very, very simple, right? Mm. Uh, we have to go back to what I, uh, the, the, the African way of learning I talked about. Mm. And that's when I propose uh, authentic learning. Right. Which is... Uh, In fact, what is authentic learning yeah. as opposed to, for example, yes. teacher-centered learning? Okay, well, teacher-centered learning is uh, a, it's an umbrella of diff different learning theories where you find uh, authentic learning is a subset of teacher-centered learning. Right, but uh, among we, we have experiential learning. We it's have like uh, a factory which simply puts individuals on an assembly line of sorts. Yeah. So when you look at teacher-centered learning, right, you you, you look at uh, you look at the entire th uh, premise mm -hmm. where that the authority is a teacher, right? No, but we need to flip that. The, the, the governments in, in in Africa and everywhere they should switch this system to be student-centered. It is a sort of dictatorship, really. Yes. You call it authority. Okay, yeah, from uh, top to down, right? So this for, for that matter, let me ask you a question. Do you find, for example, uh, in most of Africa, that uh, the population, the people who make up the population, are citizens who enjoy, for example, constitutional rights, in the earlier neighbor rights, uh, someone might even say birth rights, because they owe allegiance to the state, and therefore they are the bosses, or are they in fact subjects who owe allegiance to an individual authority who in turn can access them to what you would call privileges as opposed to rights? In essence, they are supposed to have their rights, but their rights have been really, really grabbed and taken so in all spheres of life so even in education where you are supposed to develop my passion you are supposed to de to nurture my aspiration you my natural abilities but you're teaching me otherwise because you're the teacher you're the authority you're the boss mm. you're the teacher there's a, uh, the school administrator and the hierarchy goes on and goes on to the president of the country as i grew right? up as a matter of fact uh, you started with that kind of uh, uh, system right at home yes the parents that's very for true for example represented that kind of uh, system that you are talking about yeah the church the mosque represented that same thing, the schools and the government. True. And much as we are demanding change, uh, we are asking for change in the education system, this should actually uh, encompass the parents, we the parents, 
it should start with us as well. It to, should be holistic. It, is, it, it a should holistic be a holistic sort of approach. kind of approach, solution to this. We should know what kind of, what is education for, right? And I would argue that education is for helping students to lead and solve problems. To, realize, to realize their potential. Yeah and to become productive members of society. That's 100% true. They should be able to be taught uh, and be able to lead mm -hmm. and solve interesting problems. Precisely. And what are those interesting pr problems? It means that what I'm passionate about and I see a problem, I would see to it and learn towards solving that problem. So if I'm able to solve that problem, then it means I don't need a job. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. need to ask you, the government, to create a job. I have created a job. In fact, that is very interesting because uh, I come from a family where my father was that type of entrepreneur. He created the jobs. See. He, did not, he had no benefit of Western type of education, but he was a genius. That's true. As a matter of fact, if I had about 10% of his wisdom, given the kind of advantages I have had, given the kind of exposure both in terms of uh, real life and academic and what have you, I probably could find it very easy to remove these superficial, artificial boundaries on the African continent and become the man in charge mm. of that thing called Africa. That's very true. You know? Yeah. So uh, you asked me about the difference between uh, teacher-centered and authentic learning. Mm -hmm. So. The teacher centered, we know it is uh, the, it's, uh, all its ills, that it is what it has led to where we are right now, where the teacher is the think tank, is the uh, monopoly of knowledge of everything. Correct. Right? Correct. But uh, now we need also to think about authentic learning. Authentic learning, this is. Uh, is the be it all and the end all. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They know everything, right? They used to say, and Jack yet of all the trades, truth right? is they do not. Correct. Because, they know some things. Yeah, because I, not al I, I always uh, tell and no one does really know everything. Uh, no one knows everything, uh, and I always make this controversial kind of uh, statement, uh, but which we need to really talk about. Uh, that uh, uh, why would we allow uh, this system where one lecture is being taught in a country twenty thousand times at the same time? Mm by 20,000 different people. Yet, we could actually have one amazing person who knows how to make that lecture mm. and delivers it using technology right. to these 20,000 students. How much money do you save? <laughs> right? A lot, definitely. Yeah, so authentic learning, we are talking about real life learning mm. that allows students mm. to uh, take their learning out of the classroom, mm. right? And mm. be able to do something, solve problems within their communities, right? In line of what they are interested in. So that means government should facilitate that by changing the curriculum. Uh, teachers need, need to be reoriented. It's, this is natural. They know how to do this. Teachers know how to do this. But it's the system that is really, uh, that ha has handcuffed them not to do this. Right? Then, Individuals should be able to account for their positions. Because I wonder when you are a university professor uh, at a particular university, and uh, after five years you find everyone you have taught is not doing anything, is not contributing to society, is not contributing to themselves, is not contributing to the parents that had to foot their tuition uh, or fees when they were going through school. That is a scam. It means that you are a failure, in fact. That's right. And yet it is not really uh, your fault. It is not their fault. The system is really letting them down. They should be educated differently. Uh, we should be able to look at uh, this system and say, OK, uh, is it possible to have to, to rethink the way we, we, we really think about education. Mm -hmm. uh, even parents, right, the mindset they have about education, that any successful child of mine mm -hmm. who, has, who has to live in this world have to go to university. I will argue that university as is, is not for everyone. Not only to university, right? but actually to take certain specific disciplines 
or professions. Exactly. But right? if you are smart, if, you if better you be this, like medicine, law, engineering, accountants. Something like that. Yeah, if they, they are even very prescriptive that if you don't do this, no, this in our family we don't do this. So <laughs> the mindset should change to support these students to be able to be whatever really. Yeah, be like they, uh, they can be. That's very true. Look yeah. at what is happening in different in different countries like Finland, uh, Singapore, German, uh, Japan, where they have like two paths to their education system. Right. 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 You and uh, it doesn't mean that one is inferior. No. They are at the same uh, categorization. Because in fact, in real life, they supplement and complement one another. That's, that's you need true. both. That's, you need both. So <laughs> students would choose to go the vocational and uh, technical right. or the academic stream. Precisely. Right? Yeah, and they are as prestigious as anything, right? What about uh, the issue, for example, of social, economic, political injustice? Yeah. For example, in your book, yes, uh, you indicate where you benefited uh, out of who where it is about uh, the technical who you know mm -hmm. as opposed to the technical what you know. Uh, that's very true because uh, given the education system as it is, it is not the, the, the technical uh, know-how, right? It is the technical know-who, right? Who you know. If, like, if I didn't know someone right. to be able to push me to a particular office or somewhere, right. Perhaps even like, uh, I would not even be here, right? I mean, you were talking about a passport, for example, That's right. which should in fact be <laughs> your legitimate right. <laughs> yes, like uh, countries provide uh, mechanisms of uh, obtaining a passport the express way, the ordinary way, but you walk into this place, it is your right, and you need something express because of an opportunity that has just uh, shown up, Correct. right? And you can't have this, right? And then, of course, uh, you have to be very, very creative to, that you have to go till you see the guy who is heading this agency. And you have to do it your yeah. way. But the question is how many people who can't make it to that level? Or you have to do what they call in Kenya, kitu kidogo. <laughs> oh yeah, very, very rampant at that. Yes, that is what is happening. So that is depriving people of their rights. Uh, those who they have are able to really I can't say that are able to enjoy their right because you have not enjoyed your right, you have Correct. bought it. Correct. Uh, they have not, they are always going to suffer, right? So now you have a population of, uh, that has been subjected to a system that is not really helping them make something out of their lives. Hmm. And then you ask them to pay some, pay to buy their own uh, right. When you walk back in memory lane, yes. Going back to the time when you and uh, your mother used to walk uh, 10 kilometers or 10 miles each direction in order for you to access an education. And eventually you sort of got your luck and uh, ended up uh, in Canada. You are a respectable professional uh, individual. You are a professor, you are an author of international repute. And Thank by you. the way, congratulations, really, because you. you are even an award-winning uh, professor. Thank you very much. What would you say is the single most important decision that you have made so far? And what about the single most regrettable decision, if any? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, I mean, the regrettables are a couple. Uh, the no, no, no catalog. <laughs> I just need one, <laughs> if you don't yeah. mind. So, uh, one of um, the most important decisions uh, I have made uh, was to pursue, to insist on pursuing education. And that is listening to my uh, uh, mother, right? But uh, I'm not saying it was uh, good quality education. But uh, I persisted. It was good enough uh, for you 
to end up in a world-class university That's very true. and get yourself uh, the PhD, which when I was at UCLA in graduate school, they used to refer to it as the International Trade Union Card. That's true. So I was able to diversify that kind of education for it to be able to make me the person I am uh, right now. That, that is the, the other, what we were talking about, that if you really want luck, uh, you have to dig trenches. You have such to look that, for it. Yeah, <laughs> dig trenches such that, such that luck can really uh, flow through mm. towards you, right? Mm. I, I really uh, feel that I made that, uh, that, that decision and it has worked for me, right? But at the same time, uh, I have a dis there are certain decisions I made that, uh, ho one decision that... Uh, I made uh, that I regret at some point is I, I, I still wasted too much time in education. You did? Yes. Really? Yes. How? How, how, you how uh, at some point, uh, I was trained as an economist. Right. Not as an edu initially, not as an educator. But more is better than less. Yes. But, uh, but also, at the same time, uh, expertise uh, through immersing yourself into something. Focusing like a laser beam. Yes, mm -hmm. right? It really makes you very, very good. <laughs> really? Yeah. At some point, a significant part of my life, I worked as a, uh, a, a, an economic policy advisor. Right. Uh, it is something I was good at, but not passionate about. <laughs> the system pushed me there. Really? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Bread and butter. So, yes, and, thank you. Until right. I came back home in the education to become an educationist, a place where... You felt at home. It's very true. Very good. You yeah. know, we joke about how, for example, you and I come from a place or places that are identified as Kavali. Mm. I come from Kavali, perhaps the only Kavali that I thought in fact existed. <laughs> <laughs> but you surprised me by telling me that in fact you come from another Kavali somewhere in Masaka in the Yes, in, uh, in that is if you know what they call um, Kalung mm. East constituency. Yeah. So that is Masaka Kavali there. Very interesting. Yeah. If if you were to give some advice mm. to a young man or a young woman growing up in Kavali who wants to be like you, what would you say to him or to her? What does she need to do or what does he need to do in order to not only walk in your footsteps successfully, but in fact stand on your shoulders so that he or she can see a little bit further than you? That's very true. I, yeah. Um, so uh, the most important thing is discipline. Right? Uh -huh. uh, Time apparently is not our best ally. Yes. So discipline and don't distract yourself. Okay. Right? And then look for mentors. Look for mentors. Forget about teachers. Look for mentors in life. Very they good. push you far. Yeah. On that note, our distinguished guest today has been Lawrence Muganga. Thanks to our audience for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not bitter Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.